reflections that these ions undergo when passing through a material um, and if we don't account for them we will end up blurry images like shown here so because the image quality wasn't really great the idea was kind of laid aside for quite some time however um, the idea was taken up again uh, in the early 2000s so why was that um, the reason for this is actually particle therapy. So in the early 2000s, people began treating cancers with particles and there were more and more accelerators built, so cyclotrons and synchrotrons to offer cancer treatment to patients. We can see this here um, on the PTCOC homepage. They showed the um, increase of the patients that were being treated by protons and carbon ions worldwide. And for protons, we see this exponential decrease over the past years and also for carbon ions, we see it um, if you look at the world map, um, we see that there are actually many proton therapy uh, facilities that are already built and in operation, and also some uh, carbon ion treatment facilities, and also some facilities that offer both ion types. So in general, when I'm talking about ion imaging today, the principles that I'm speaking about can be applied to uh, multiple ion types. So the typical ones are protons, carbon ions, and helium. Um, however, I'm going to focus a lot on proton imaging today because it's the most common one. Most um, of the cancer treatment facilities uh, that offer particle therapy, they offer it with protons, as you can see. So this will be the main focus of the talk as well. So when it comes to ion beam therapy compared to photon therapy, of course, we have to deal with different physics processes here. So for conventional photon therapy for cancer treatment, um, we of course know that photons, um, photon beams decrease following the Bell and Bell law um, in matter. So we see this here um, on um, this uh, is actually a Monte Carlo simulation that we did. 
um, the red dotted line here is an X-ray beam, and we see this um, electronic buildup in the beginning, and then we see this exponential decrease following Bell and Bear's law, so the dose decreases exponentially. When we look at ion beams, of course, the behavior is different. We have different physics here. So um, the energy deposition of ions is described by the beta block formula. So um, the physical quantity we are interested in here is the so-called stopping power. And the stopping power is proportional to the reciprocal of the velocity squared of the particle. So this gives us this very typical shape we can see here. Um, so we have at first the plateau region where we have little energy deposition, and then when the velocity becomes lower, so when the particle slows down and comes to the end of its range in a material, we have a high buildup in those, which we refer to as the Bragg peak. And we have this for different ion species here. So for blue, we see it for protons. So we see after the maximum peak we have here, the dose really goes down to almost zero um, very quickly. And uh, for other ion beams, it looks very similar. However, here we have to deal with the fragmentation tail. Um, so for carbon ions, for example, they fragment a lot. So we have a quite um, high and significant dose even after the frag peak. And for helium, this uh, dose tail is not that much pronounced, but still we have some fragmentation. Um, so for therapy, we can use this Bragg peak shape um, because what we want to do is we have we want to have a high dose in the tumorous region, of course, and a very low dose in the non-tumorous region. Um, so to achieve that for photon therapy, we need multiple beam directions to achieve a high dose in the tumorous area. However, you can see that we still have some significant dose in the surrounding areas. If we look at this proton therapy treatment plan, we see that we need fewer beam directions. So in that case, it was only three. And we still achieve a very high dose in the tumorous area while sparing the healthy tissue that's surrounding. Um, to achieve that, we use a so-called spread out Bragg peak. So it's not only one Bragg peak, but it's multiple energies being used. So we have overlaying um, those maxima to get an even distribution in the tumorous area. OK, so now that we have seen the advantages of um, particle therapy over conventional photon therapy, we have to take a step back and think about the treatment planning itself. So usually what is being done currently is that an X-ray CT scan is taken and used to identify the tumorous area. However, there's a very apparent problem um, because an X-ray CT, of course, is given by different physics um, than the particle therapy. So an X-ray CT gives you Hounsfield units. Um, they are described by the linear attenuation coefficients of the materials the X-ray beam passed through. Um, so we see this here. Um, it's basically the linear attenuation coefficients of the materials um, in regard to the one in water. And to do particle therapy, we are interested in the relative stopping power. So we somehow need to convert Hounsfield units to relative stopping power values to do therapy. And this introduces severe range uncertainties that have been described quite a while ago. Uh, so a typical um, way to do this um, this calibration from Hounsfield units to relative stopping powers was given by uh, Schneider and Schaffner. Um, so it's a stoichiometric um, calibration. And we can see, especially in the area with the uh, bone material, breast, and fat, um, there's multiple models that actually describe this conversion. So it's really not a trivial problem to do so. So one potential solution that um, came up was that you could do the direct measurement of the planning CT with ions themselves. So use the same particle species for the imaging and the planning procedure and for the particle therapy treatment itself. This would um, help to get rid of this conversion from Hounsfield units and relative stopping powers because you would get the relative stopping power directly from your planning CT if you do it with particles as well. Um, of course, um, we still have this problem of the poor spatial resolution that I've shown you in the beginning. So we would get very blurry images if we just measured with ions. But um, the first images of, of ion radiography and tomography were taken in the 60s and 70s. So we can make use of the developments that have been done in hardware and software. So just um, a quick view at those considerations when we now compare imaging with um, ions and with photons. So of course, the planning procedure um, induces less dose to a patient than the therapy itself. Um, however, every dose that we can spare to a patient is important. So it also makes sense to compare the imaging procedures in 
um, case of those. Um, so for one um, proton imaging group um, from the Chicago Proton Center, they did a study with a pig's head and they did a conventional X-ray CT in the proton CT. And they showed that for X-ray CT, they ended up between four and 39 milligrays. Uh, while for proton CT, they got the scan between 0 0.2 and 0 0.7 milligrays. So a huge difference in those, which makes sense if, again, we look at the physics. So for imaging, we are in the plateau area because we want the ion beam to pass through the patient if we do imaging. Um, so we are really in the low dose region here. Um, there have been quite some other studies there um, that compared helium CT, proton CT, single energy CT, and dual energy CT. And again, we can see for the X-ray CT scans, we end up with about 60 milligray. And uh, for proton CT, it's 4.7. And helium CT, this group measured 6.6 .6 milligray for a full tomography scan. Uh, for helium CT, of course, the dose is a bit higher than for proton CT because, as I said, we end up with fragmentation here. Um, so this will always increase the dose. Uh, another study that was done in 2019 also showed that a uh, PCT scan was done below 2 milligray dose. So we are really in a very low dose region here for a CT. So now to understand a bit more the problem and the differences between X-ray CT and uh, proton computer tomography or ion computer tomography in general. So for X-ray CT, um, we would have one detector downstream the patient, which allows us to measure the remaining intensity of an X-ray beam. Uh, so this can be, for example, a photon counting detector or some integrating device. Um, and we can assume that the X-ray beams went quite straight through the patient or our object to the image, our phantom that we want to investigate. So what we are basically doing is we are comparing an initial intensity, which we know, with a residual intensity. And then when uh, we rotate the system around the patient and want to reconstruct our 3D image, what we can do is, so to say, do the math along straight lines. So we can really assume that the X-rays went straight through the patient. Um, for ion imaging, this is a little different because, as I said, we would end up with blurry images if we did it exactly like that. Um, one thing is we don't want to measure an intensity, we want to measure an energy because the stopping power is depending on the energy loss of the ions um, in the patient. Um, so we have to replace this intensity detector by some detector that gives us the energy of ions. And what we also do is we add a tracking setup. So we do an upstream tracker and a downstream tracker, which is basically two detector modules um, on each side of the patient or phantom, which allows us to measure positions. So if we have two um, detector planes upstream and two downstream, what we receive is not only a position, but also a direction upstream and downstream of the patient. And we can use this and um, make it part of our reconstruction um, to um, make a, a, a guess on each single particle's path that it has taken through the patient. So what is important here is really we are doing single particle tracking. Each particle has to be monitored independently. Um, for path algorithms um, that you can use to estimate the path, there are various possibilities. So the simplest one would be a simple straight line approach. So we have an initial position direction and um, ending position and direction, and we just draw a straight line between these two. Um, so this will give us um, an image, but of course the um, quality will be poorer than when we use a sophisticated path algorithm. So um, there's, for example, the cubic spline. Um, and another possibility would be the so-called most likely path, uh, because the physics of the problem is very well defined. We know that there is multiple Coulomb scattering going on, and we know how it works. So we can use our particle positions and directions, um, approximate the um, the multiple Coulomb scattering by a Gaussian distribution used by Bayesian statistics and do a most likely path out of that. And then in the end, which actually gives us the projection value that we want to use for our reconstruction, we still need the energy measurement device. So usually that's a range telescope or a calorimeter. And then again, of course, we have to rotate the whole setup around our patient or phantom and then use the information to put it back into a 3D image. Okay, so now I would like to give you a short overview about our measurement environment, actually. Um, so as I said, um, the ion imaging group is from Vienna, and um, we are doing our measurements at the Medostron facility. So it's a synchrotron accelerator complex, and it's located approximately 50 kilometers south of Vienna. So 
one thing that is very special about this facility is actually that it offers four radiation rooms where three are only for clinical use and they are limited to clinical energies. But there's also one um, irradiation room which is really dedicated exclusive to research. Uh, so here we have carbon ions available from 120 to 400 MeV per atomic mass unit, and we have protons from 60 to 800 MeV. So we are not limited to clinical energies, which would, which would be um, 250 MeV, but we also have higher energies that we can use. Um, the beam can only be at one room at a time. So usually um, the, uh, there's the clinical treatment during the week, and we are able to use the radiation room one on weekends. Uh, so we have our shifts and measurement times then. For the beam parameters in the radiation room one, we have a spot size um, from seven millimeter to 21 millimeter full width at half maximum. And for our research, we also commissioned low flux settings. And I will come back to that in a bit. Um, so here you can see the radiation room one, that one um, that is dedicated to research only. Um, and what you can see here um, is a, a positioning system that we can use. So it's a robotic arm and it also offers a CT ring. Um, then uh, we have the uh, ion source. Um, then, um, so usually we don't use the positioning system, but we mount our experiment on a table here. And then we have two ISO centers that we are able to use with a laser positioning system. Um, one ISO center is currently being in use. Um, the whole setup is then monitored via a webcam, webcam from a different room. Um, so for the physics mode of the accelerator that is used in this um, irradiation room, we uh, use the low particle flux, so there's no scanning um, possibility, but we have fixed beam. Um, and as I said, we have proton energies up to 800 MeV, and there are also energies between the clinical 250 MeV and 800 MeV that are commissioned. Okay, so just to say a few words about the low flux settings. So Medostron is actually commissioned for clinical rates, which means that we have 10 to the power of 9 particles per second. So this is quite heavy, um, especially for experiments where you want to do single particle tracking. So um, this flux would have been way too high for our experimental setup. So we initiated a low flux topic at Medostron, which was actually quite an adventure because of course you cannot monitor everything that happens within the accelerator. So you adjust um, the um, options you have and see how the beam turns out in the end. So basically um, it was uh, three possibilities we investigated here. Uh, one was to reduce the particle number that is injected to the synchrotron um, by changing the electrostatic deflector. The second one was extending the extraction time um, to the high energy beam transfer line by changing the Betatron core ramping. Um, and then also what we did is to increase the beam spot size so it exceeds uh, the size of the vacuum tube. And um, with that, we managed to achieve a low particle rates in the radiation room one. Um, so we have uh, three different settings commissioned now there um, where we can go down to rates in the order of kilohertz. Uh, so the lowest flex setting is 10 to the power of four particles every five seconds. Um, and then we also have a medium and a high low flex setting. And actually these um, Settings are also used by many other experiments now um, that are being done at Medostron. So it's pretty convenient for research. So just to give you a bit of a timeline um, about um, of our project. So Medostron uh, was built in 2015 and 16, and they had their first patient treatment in the beginning of 2017. Um, at that time, um, the research also began operation, and uh, soon after the kick of the of the Ion CT project um, took place, and we had regular beam times at the Medostron facility. So our intermediate goal was to build a proton CT demonstrator system and operate it and test it at Medostron. So. Um, to do so, we wanted to use the knowledge we already had. Um, so um, the Institute of High Energy Physics is um, very experiment, uh, um, experienced in um, particle physics experiments with very high energies. So um, collaborations with the CERN and Bell, for example. Um, and we wanted to use also existing material to build a demonstrator, learn from that, and then um, 
decide how to improve the system for the future. So the overall goal, of course, is always to build a clinical system in the end. So we are a joint group um, of the High Energy Physics Institute and the Technical University of Vienna. Um, in 2018, the tracking system of our PCT demonstrator become up, became operational. Um, then sometime later in 2020, we were able to become the range telescope we are using operational. And in 2020, we were finally able to do a first PCT scan with our demonstrator setup. Um, so since then, um, we have done quite some improvements. We investigated other proton imaging modalities at the Medostrum facility. Um, we did our image reconstruction code and published it. And currently, our developments are based on hardware mainly. So we are currently investing time of flight proton city. And I will talk about all of this in a bit. So here you can see an overview of the system we are using at Medostrum. So um, as I said, we have a tracking setup, a front tracker and a rear tracker. In between, we have a rotary table with our phantom mounted on it. So in our case, we are not moving the system around the phantom, but we are uh, rotating the phantom itself. Then we have two trigger scintillators. These are necessary um, to correlate the single detector hits to one another um, with our alignment software. So to get from single detector hits to an actual track fit for each single particle. And then in the end, we have a range telescope for the energy measurement. So this is how the system looks like um, when it is installed at Medostron. So uh, in that case, we would have the beam coming from the left side. Um, then the detector is actually only this part here mounted on the green plate. So we have four of them, one, two, three, four in between. We have the rotary table and the phantom mounted on it, then the trigger scintillators, and here you can just see one small part of the range telescope, which comes here in the end. Um, so we used existing hardware from um, other experiments uh, we had experience on. Um, so for tracking, we have two double-sided silicon strip detector modules with a size of approximately 5 times 2.5 square centimeters and a thickness of 300 micrometers. Um, which means we have 512 p-doped and n-doped uh, strips there with a pitch of 50 micrometers and 100 micrometers. The readout was used from other experiments, so um, from the Bell 2 readout chain, um, where we are also taking part in the experiment. Um, for the energy measurement, we were using the range telescope, which was formerly used by the Terra collaboration. So it's basically plastic scintillators with silicon photomultipliers. Um, the range telescope itself consists of 38 slices with a thickness of 3 millimeters um, and the frontal size of 300 times 300 square millimeters. And with that, we are able to measure protons up to 140 MeV residual energy, which is actually kind of a limiting factor because you really have to consider that the residual energy should not exceed this or you will need another absorber block um, before your range telescope, um, which then again smears your signal. So. Um, this is a limiting factor, and I'm going to talk about this and address this when I'm going to talk about time of flight CT then. Um, the reader is done via USB, and uh, together with the tracking setup, we were able to measure about 900 proton CT events per second. Um, as a phantom, we are using a small aluminum stair profile. So as you can see, um, the detector size we are using really limits the size of our phantom we are able to use. So for that reason, we are mainly using this aluminum cube because it scatters the proton beam quite a lot. So you can still see scattering effects, although the phantom is quite small. And then we have these increasing stair sizes um, to make an analysis with detect, uh, different material thicknesses. Um, so this is actually um, referring to our range telescope. Um, so as I said, it was used by another collaboration in the beginning, and we really had to do a whole update on the firmware and on the hardware here. So we have replaced basically everything in this um, range telescope to use it again um, and to make stable operation possible. Um, so how does it perform? Um, so for a range telescope, we are not directly measuring energy, um, but we are looking at the water equivalent thickness um, of protons in matter. So um, 
we can see it here on the bottom of the slide. Um, when a proton enters, we get a signal for each slice of the calorimeter. So in the beginning, uh, the energy deposition matches to the plateau shape of the Bragg peak area. And then we have a very high peak. And after that, the dose goes um, down to zero again. Um, and we use two thresholds here. So um, if we have a signal exceeding threshold one, and in the next slide, um, slice uh, a signal that is below threshold two, we know that this is the bed we are looking for. And yeah, the uh, water equivalent thickness is of course a quantity that depends on the ion energy. So we can use this directly for our reconstruction. Here again, we can see uh, multiple Bragg peaks that we measured with the range telescope at different proton beam energies. And then we can see here um, that we calibrated the ranges we got from our range telescope with data from NIST um, to get to our final projection value that we use in the reconstruction. Um, for the tracking setup, we also did quite an uh, intensive study uh, because you have a lot of degrees of freedom when it comes to tracking. And these degrees of freedom really heavily influence the spatial resolution you will have in the very end when you reconstruct your image. So for example, you have the detector clearance, um, so the distance between the innermost detectors and your object to be imaged. Then you have the distance between the two detector planes themselves, um, upstream and downstream. Um, you have the spatial resolution of the detectors and many, many more, the material budget, for example. So we did a huge study on this and you can just see some of the plots that resulted from this study here on the right side of the slide. Um, so um, also we used uh, different uh, phantom thicknesses. So our phantom here was just water blocks and we did a uh, Monte Carlo simulation to do this study. Um, what is nicely to see here is that for helium ion beams, um, you always get a higher spatial resolution than for proton beams, which is to be expected because we have a different charge to mass ratio. So helium ion beams go more straight through a material than proton beams do. But then again, you have the fragmentation you have to take care of by some filtering. Um, okay, so to come back to our setup and the reconstruction we actually want to solve. So what we are getting is, um, so I was speaking about the water equivalent thickness um, and for single ions, we are also referring to it as the water equivalent path length we receive for each single ion when we do measurements. Um, this is defined by the integral over the single ion path over the relative stopping power. So the quantity we actually want to know from our reconstruction. This again is um, equivalent to an integral over the energy loss of each single ion over the reciprocal of the stopping power. Um, so this is again given by the beta block equation. Um, so our reconstruction workflow works like that. We are doing our measurements and doing alignment and tracking with the Cori Recon software. It's a software that was developed by CERN and is used in many high energy physics experiments there. Um, then we do our data binning and analysis with customized C++ and Python scripts. And in the end, image reconstruction is done with the Tigre toolbox, which is a framework that was initially um, developed for X-ray imaging. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail. Um, so just to show you a reconstruction uh, we did with our demonstrator data. So this is real measurement data we took from Medostron. You can see three proton radiographs here um, at different angles. Um, so also in the first picture, when uh, we look at the zero degree, I don't know if you can see it, um, but uh, you also see the Kapton tape we used to mount the Phantom on the rotary stage. Of course, you can very nicely see the stair profile in the radiography, then we turn it. And then in the front view, you can also see the different stair thicknesses very nicely here. Um, then we have a 3D rendering of the, um, of the reconstruction that we did. So we used 18 proton radiographs um, in total. And then we analyzed the relative stopping power we got from our reconstruction in each phantom step. And we could see um, quite an offset for the thinnest step, but for the other ones, um, the expected uh, value matched very well with what we actually measured. Um, however, the measurement took us two full days. So um, really the system we are using is a demonstrator system um, that should help to gain knowledge towards a clinical system in the future. 
Um, so just a short disclaimer that, um, of course, it's not only possible to do energy loss CT with ion beams, but there are also other ion imaging modalities that we investigated that can be um, done with the very same setup. Um, so one of this is scattering imaging. So to make use of the tracking information only, so we don't need a range telescope or a calorimeter for this imaging modality, um, but basically is what we obtain when we have an ion beam that passes through some material um, is that we broaden the angular distribution of the ion beam. So in the beginning, we will have a very sharp Gaussian distribution and um, after passing through a material, the a standard deviation of this di distribution will become wider, which is described by the Highland formula. Uh, we can use this value to reconstruct the scattering tomography. Um, and uh, to gain knowledge about the material budget um, about, uh, of the object that we imaged. Another possibility is attenuation CT. So this is basically the equivalent to conventional X-ray CT. So we can also measure how many ions um, got absorbed within the object that we imaged. Um, and this gives us information about the linear nuclear inelastic cross-section of the material. So I'm just showing you three radiographs of the three different imaging modalities here that we have taken um, at Met Austrian. So the one for energy loss you've seen already. Then we have beam attenuation radiography. Um, and then we have one multiple Coulomb scattering uh, radiography here. So, but for now, I'm going to focus again on the energy loss um, CT because this is the quantity which is clinically relevant. However, as you get all three imaging modalities basically at once, because it's the same setup you can use, so you can always get all these three images out of one scan, um, there might be some possibilities to combine them in the future. Okay, so, but now to talk a bit more um, in detail about how we obtain our 3D images from our projection data that we measure. Um, so I think I'm surrounded by great mathematicians, so this will be very trivial to you, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Um, so our reconstruction um, basically comes down to this equation that I've shown you before. So um, the values that we measure is the water equivalent path lengths of the single ions, um, which are given by the integral over the path of the relative stopping power. So we can put this in a set of linear equations. So we have a system matrix A, which describes the intersection lengths of the ions with the um, volume they pass through. Um, then we have X, which is our unknown image. So for us um, in ion CT, it is the relative stopping power. Um, and then we have the value um, B, the vector B, uh, which contains the water equivalent path lengths of the ions. So when we measure, um, of course, we rotate our system um, or our phantom to get projections at different angles. And then we want to find a solution for this equation because we want to solve for x. So uh, for INCT, there's basically two possibilities. Um, when we measure and do single particle tracking, we refer to the data as list mode data. Um, we can use this list mode data as it is, um, but then we would have to adapt reconstruction algorithms to really contain the information of each single ions. Um, so our system matrix actually grows enormously by that fact. So for um, X-ray CT, we have one projection value per pixel. If for ion CT, we are using the single particle data in the reconstruction itself, um, this would mean that at least we have 100 protons or ions per pixel. Um, so the problem really increases, and I guess all of you know that already uh, image reconstruction for X-ray CT um, in a sophisticated way is a quite intended problem to solve. Um, so it gets worse for ion CT. Um, however, there were some approaches to do so, um, but still, even on the GPU cluster, solving this equation then um, takes hours sometimes. Um, another possibility is to bin the data uh, and make use of conventional um, X-ray CT reconstruction algorithms. So to do a binning in the synogram space. Um, and then in the back projection, um, what we do is uh, looking for a solution for the unknown image X. Okay, so to talk a bit about um, the TIGRA toolbox, um, as I said, it was developed for X-ray CT. 
um, and it offers um, many iterative algorithms for XYZT to solve for the unknown X. So um, in INCT, as I said, uh, this would be the relative stopping power now. So the image I've shown you before was actually reconstructed with this toolbox. Um, and what made it very interesting to also use it for eye imaging is actually that um, on the one hand, it's very fast. So the projection and back projection operators are implemented in CUDA. But then again, um, it offers a very nice and simple MATLAB header for user scripts and algorithms. And I think this is one crucial point we should always think of when we are doing reconstruction and developing stuff, um, that it will not be us that should use it in the end, but it will be groups that might be not very experienced with programming. So it's really helpful if you have a simple tool that's actually usable for other groups, because the next steps it will be biologists, medical scientists, um, that should really use this. So we have to make sure that they can be able to use it and that it not only stays in research and pure science. Um, so as I said, our um, system kind of limits the size of um, the phantom we are able to use. So we are also relying a lot on Monte Carlo simulations here. So the two we are using are Shant4 and Gate. It's again, two software tools that were developed by CERN and they are heavily used in the high energy physics community for doing particle simulations. And we implemented two phantoms there. Uh, one is the high resolution module, um, Katfan module. Um, it's basically a plastic cylinder that has line per inserts of aluminum with decreasing size. And the second one is the sensitometry module. Um, again, um, we have a plastic cylinder and within that there are multiple different um, cylindrical inserts of different materials with higher and lower stopping power. So the baseline is always the relative stopping power of water, which is of course one. Um, and then we have here materials ranging between 0 0.5 and 1.8 or two um, relative stopping power. So above and below the one of water. And the system that we implemented um, is uh, in the Monte Carlo simulation is again, uh, uh, contains an upstream tracker and the downstream tracker. Um, in the simulation, we were able to leave out the simulation of full calorimeter um, because you can measure the energy directly at the detectors and at uh, energy resolution um, you would like it to have. So our very first reconstruction approach was actually using the Tico toolbox as it is. Um, so we had to do some kind of binning um, to make CT-like data out of our proton CT data. Um, so what we did is that we binned our projection data in the ISO center using a very simple straight line path estimate. And then we used the OSART and ASDPOX algorithm for reconstruction. Um, so this gave us kind of a blurry image, which was to be expected when you just use a straight line path estimate. Um, we use data cuts to improve um, the image quality. So based on the tracking, we looked at the initial direction of the ion and at the ex exit direction of the ion and the ions that got scattered too intensely were just removed from the data set. Um, we used 800 protons per square millimeters, uh, which is um, a very typical dose to use, a very typical flux to use for ion CT. Um, and with that, we were able to uh, resolve up to three line per centimeter in the high resolution module and to receive RSP areas in the order of 1%, which is actually quite good. But of course, the spatial resolution was still um, a thing we um, should improve on. And also, it is very apparent what's uh, the drawback of this reconstruction workflow, because um, you should not just um, do data cuts and remove a huge fraction of your data just to get a better image, because in the end, we want this to be applied in the clinics. And this would mean additional dose, dose to the patient if we just cut away data and not use it. Um, but as I said, the structure of Tigra still made it interesting for ion imaging because it is easy to adapt the framework and to add something new. Um, so this is what I am going to talk about next. So we implemented a pre-reconstruction binning step for proton CT image reconstruction um, in the framework and uh, it is now published as part of the framework itself. Um, so it's basically a maximum likelihood approach that is being used here um, to generate um, synogram data from your list mode data that is, again, CT-like. So in the end, you're able to use conventional CT reconstruction algorithms. So how does it work? Um, I'll go from left to right now. Um, 
let's assume we have an ion uh, with a specific ion path we see here in this dark blue shade. Um, so in the end, we have a detector uh, with multiple pixels, and we have one pixel where the particle would hit. In case of a very simple straight line approach, we would assume the pixel of arrival actually gives us the travel direction of the ion. So here in yellow, we could see the path estimate. If we would now just do um, a simple, um, if we would just do some um, actual CT reconstruction without um, thinking about a sophisticated path estimate, but just using the pixel of arrival, um, we would back project along this trajectory. And you can see that we are far off from the original ion path. So of course, we will get a blurry image if we assign the information we measure to the wrong image. So um, there was an idea by Collins Vickit in 2015, which was actually to divide our reconstruction volume into multiple channels. So these channels just mean um, that we divide the volume um, by extending our detector pixels to the source direction. Um, so we can see this here with these um, dotted lines. And then um, when we look at our pixel of arrival, we don't assign the proton directly to this pixel. But what we do is we use our tracking information and do a sophisticated path estimate. So here, for example, a cubic spline was used. Um, we do this between source and detector position. Um, then what we can do is to calculate the intercepts of the ion path with the different channels and assign the ion to all of the channels that it went through. We can do this with a weighting factor um, that depends on the length the ion has actually spent within each channel. So what we can see here, um, the ion has spent the most uh, time in the uppermost channel, so the highest weight will go to the top pi uh, pixel of the detector here. Um, and in the end, in that case, we would assign um, the projection value to four detector pixels. Um, this approach was actually intended to be used for radiography, not for tomography. But as we are using tomography, we can assume that we actually also know our object hull because you can do this with simple filtered back projection, straight line approach. This is enough to distinguish air and your object to be imaged. Um, so we know our object boundaries quite well. Um, so we Kind of, uh, we refined this approach a bit um, by making use of the object hull. So what uh, we did is um, we were doing a straight line path estimation in air, which is absolutely sufficient in air because you don't have a lot of scattering. And in the object, we were doing um, optimized cubic spline approach. And to the equation that gives you the watt equivalent thickness for each detector pixel, we added another weighting factor depending if we were inside the object hull or outside. Because in air, we don't expect the particle to lose a lot of energy, but the main energy will be lost in the object itself. Um, so when we compare these two approaches, we will see that this additional weighting factor will actually prefer this pixel over the top pixel because although the time spent in the top channel might have been longer than in the um, second channel here, um, the most time within the object was spent in the second channel. So the highest weight goes to this pixel. Um, so in that way, uh, we are able to bin our data for sinograms and then use them with the conventional CT reconstruction algorithms. Uh, we implemented this pre-reconstruction binning step in Tigre using the same structure as for the framework itself. So the binning itself is done in CUDA, communicating with a C++ layer with a top MATLAB script for the user. The extension we tested again with Monte Carlo data because, again, we could use larger phantoms there. Uh, we used the Kaplan modules I've already shown you before and used 180 projections per scan and 225 protons per square millimeter. So we went down with the dose as compared to our very initial reconstruction workflow. We investigated two setups, a very ideal one, just to see how good we can go with this approach. So one micrometer thin tracker plane, so far from reality, uh, with ideal so infinite spatial and energy resolution, and then a non-ideal setup, uh, which um, applies more to reality. So we have 300 micrometer thin tracker planes in the simulation, and uh, we have a realistic spatial and energy resolution. So for each radiograph, um, it took below uh, 0 0.5 seconds um, when we were using one GPU, uh, so 90 seconds for 180 projections, to do the pre-reconstruction binning and then use a conventional uh, CT algorithm on top. 
um, the reconstruction we did with the ASD POX algorithm um, as it was implemented in TITRA already. And we got an additional time then for the reconstruction between two and six minutes, depending on the scan. So these are uh, reconstructions I can show you um, of the high resolution module. Um, I'm comparing here the original approach by Collins Fikita and the slightly refined one we did um, by considering the optical. And we can see the um, results in the top row for the ideal setup and in the bottom row for the non-ideal setup. And we can see that the refined approach um, luckily outperforms the original approach. Um, so we calculated and approximated the modular transfer function with the maximum to minimum line pair contrast um, in, the, um, in the module. And you can see the results and the plots here. So for the ideal setup, we could go up to eight line pairs per centimeter that we could resolve. And for the non-ideal, we were between five and six line pairs per centimeter that we could actually resolve here. And then for the sensitometry module, we um, calculated the relative stopping power in the cylindrical inserts of um, the phantom. And we got um, the mean absolute percentage error out of this by combining the information from all the single cylindrical inserts. And we can see that we are below 0.5% RSP error, which is actually pretty good. Um, so for clinical trial, you would want to be always below 1%. So. Um, this seems to be possible, at least from what the simulations say. Um, then we also did um, a scan of an anthropomorphic phantom also in the simulation. So um, basically what we did is taking a CT scan and implementing it in a Monte Carlo simulation and to reconstruct it. Um, and just to show you the huge difference it makes if you do or do not um, do a sophisticated path estimate and pre-reconstruction binning, I also reconstructed it once with just this very trivial straight line back projection uh, without caring for the actual ion path, but just taking the pixel of arrival. And you can really see the huge difference uh, between the reconstructions here. So also it was a very low dose scan. So we were just taking 90 projections and 50 protons per square millimeter to do this reconstruction. Um, and for the reconstruction, pre-reconstruction binning, we can really see a huge improvement. And again, we could see that the um, uh, approach using the optical outperformed the original approach that was proposed here for radiography only in the beginning. Okay, so um, for the remaining time, I would like to give you a bit of an outlook, which will again be more related to hardware, I hope you don't mind, um, on how we are planning to improve our INCT setup. And this comes down to this one equation I've written here, so the kinetic energy um, of the ions is, of course, given by their velocity. And this is, again, of course, related to the time of flight of particles. So there's two approaches um, how to make use of this quantity to do INCT, which are currently being investigated. So one would be the so-called conventional time of flight INCT system, which consists of six um, detector planes that are able to measure time. Um, so in the beginning, the four detector planes, um, so we have one upstream and one downstream tracker again, and then we add another two planes and measure the time of flight between um, these two planes and these two planes. Um, so we have particles um, that travel through air in between these two, um, and we get timing information. And again, we measure position and direction also at these very last detector planes because we need to make an estimate about the ion path between these two if we want to have the um, path that the ions have actually traveled through air. Um, a second approach is more simpler in design, but more sophisticated in how to use it. Uh, we call it the sandwich time of flight CT because it only consists of an upstream tracker and a downstream tracker. Because basically we get timing information between these two as well. Um, but here, what we have to think of is that we don't only have ions that travel through air and we're measuring this time, um, but we have the, the interesting part is actually the ions that have traveled through air, through a material, and then through air again. Um, so this needs a more sophisticated calibration on how to use this time of flight to actually get to the stopping power in the end, which is the quantity we want to know. Um, so for the first, for the conventional um, uh, of um, INCT scanning apparatus, we did a very um, large study uh, with Monte Carlo simulations again, where we implemented um, time of flight calorimeter with 
uh, realistic assumptions in the simulation. So we really um, implemented um, full uh, timing detectors with um, uh, realistic timing resolutions um, in this simulation. And what we could see is that with such a system, uh, we could decrease RSP errors down to 0.12% maximum, but it would but it would require um, timing detectors that are able to resolve um, 30 to 50 picoseconds of time resolution. Um, what we also could see is that an energy modulated beam would improve the performance. And um, one thing I want to mention here is as compared to the system I've shown you before, where we have a calorimeter in the end to measure the energy, now we have the huge advantage that we don't have to stop the ions in a calorimeter. So we don't care for the um, for the size of the residual energy, actually. Um, so this is a huge advantage of the system. Here you can see two reconstructions that were done um, with um, a time of flight system implemented in a Monte Carlo study. So we see for 30 picoseconds, we get quite a good image and quite good uh, stopping power resolution uh, for 100 picoseconds, again, we have a lot of artifacts and the image really worsens above 50 picoseconds. So this is really the area um, we found out to be optimum uh, for time of flight INCT. Um, the second system, the sandwich system, um, here we actually did some tests at Medostron already. Um, so we had uh, one, one upstream tracker, one downstream tracker, and in between we had some PMMA slabs. Um, and we used different thicknesses of these slabs and tried to um, measure the time of flight and compare it to what a uh, shown for Monte Carlo simulation would give us. And we actually saw a good agreement here between the measured time of flight and the expected time of flight. Um, the calibration um, of such a system for reconstruction ends up with something we call the slowing down power. So we have the uh, in contrast to the relative stopping power, it's now a slowing down power, which is given by the time of flight um, minus the time of flight in vacuum. So um, we would have, uh, when we measure our um, time with our timing detectors, we would have an offset to the expected time of flight in vacuum that we have to consider and which actually gives us the energy information. So this offset arises because of the energy loss each ion has in the material it passed through. So this is actually the interesting quantity we want to use. Um, and by um, looking at this equation in detail, we can actually see that it directly leads us to the relative stopping power. So basically, the slowing down power and the relative stopping power um, are the same. Um, and we can use this value directly for image reconstruction. So there was a very recent paper of my colleague, which explains um, the principle in a bit more detail. Um, again, just uh, to briefly show you two reconstructions here with a very ideal time resolution of zero picoseconds, of course, not something we can reach, um, and a more realistic one with 30 picoseconds. Um, we still see that we get kind of a good image, but again, artifacts begin arising. So um, the system I've shown you before with the six detector planes will give us a better image um, as for the calibration we have now for the sandwich stuff. Um, but still, it seems to be a feasible um, opportunity to do imaging only with the upstream and the downstream stack tracker with the timing information. Um, so just a few comments on the hardware we use here. Um, so as we need timing information, of course, we need detectors that have some timing resolution. And um, a very nice candidate for this are lone gain avalanche diodes. Um, so it's a semiconductor technology. So the basic principle is just as for every silicon sensor that you have ionizing radiation that uh, creates electron hole pairs within the sensor. And then we have some intrinsic signal amplification. Um, low gain avalanche de detectors work um, at uh, low gain. So it's a, a gain an amplification factor between 10 and 30. And this actually allows for very uh, no very low noise properties as compared to other detectors, and also allows for a very high time resolution. So they are very nice candidates to use it uh, for time of flight CT. Um, 
So just a few of the specs of these detectors. Um, the timing resolution down to 30 to 50 picoseconds is absolutely possible with these detectors. So this is actually the area we identified the need for a time of flight INCT. So very nice for us. Uh, then we have a very high spatial resolution, which is below 100 micrometers. So for the clinical application, actually, it could even be worse and we would still be happy, but this is amazing for <laughs> imaging. Um, and they also offer a very low material budget, which is also nice because you don't want your ions to scatter a lot in the detectors you use for tracking. They scatter a lot in the patient, but you don't want to add additional um, uh, problems by having very thick detectors. They are also very radiation hardware, which is of course important when you come to INCT and you can build them up to large areas. Um, so this is the reason why they are heavily used in the high energy physics community in multiple experiments of CERN, for example, ATLAS or CMS or RD50, also for the hardest um, experiment, they use ELGATS. And now, as I said, we are also investigating them for ion imaging. Um, so in April, uh, so very recently, there was also a test beam at Medostrum, um, where there was a first um, test of um, having a, a of ICT setup um, with the phantom in the middle. So we had the four detector planes and placed again our aluminum stair profile in the middle. Um, this is here what you can see, um, what is to expect um, to be seen from a Monte Carlo simulation we did before. And currently the analysis of this test beam is still work in progress, but we hope to end up with kind of this image um, that we saw in the Monte Carlo simulation already. Okay, so with this point, I'm actually at the end of my talk. So um, we built an INCT demonstrator system that we um, heavily used at Medostron to do energy loss, um, scattering and attenuation um, imaging with ions. Um, I've shown you the system, I've shown you an overview of our measurement setup. Um, the reconstruction was done with the Tigre toolbox and the code for this is openly available, so it's open source. Um, and for the hardware upgrades of our system, we are currently investigating um, LGATS for time of flight CT. Um, another interesting point is, as I said, I only focus on protons for my talk, but um, actually helium seems to be a very nice candidate to do ion imaging because of um, the lower scattering as compared to proton beams and less fragmentation as compared to carbon ion beams. So it seems to be a good trade-off. And currently helium, um, ion beams are commissioned at Medostron, so we hope to do imaging with this in the future as well. Um, so with that, of course, it's not only me working on the project, but I have to say a huge thanks to the group in Vienna and to Felix from GSI, which is kind of the core team. Then again, a huge thanks to the people from Medical University, DPU and Creatis, which helped a lot with the imagery construction task. Also a huge thanks to Ander Biguri, I think he's there in person. So hi, Ander, and thanks a lot for your help. Uh, without you, the reconstruction part would not have been possible in a way we did it in the end. So thank you and thank all of you for your attention. Uh, no, we can we can directly use the water equivalent path length. So. Uh, sorry again, can you can you repeat the last question? Sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the path estimate we do for each single ion is done in three dimensions. 
So, uh, I mean, of course, the scattering is independent uh, in both planes, so you can treat them independently in both planes and do kind of a path estimate um, independently in both planes, but you account for both of them in the end when you match it to the detector pixels in the end. Uh, 3D at once. Yeah, um, so, so yeah, one thing was that we used the electrostatic deflector to um, decrease the number of particles that we inject into the synchrotron itself. Um, then we changed the Betatron core ramping to extend the extraction time um, of particles to the high energy beam transfer line. And the third thing was increasing the beam spot size um, to make the beam spot size larger than the actual vacuum tube, so we lose uh, particles there. But as I said, it had to be done, we call it blindly, because you cannot monitor inside the accelerator. So you really have to um, adjust your settings and then see what comes out of the source in the end. So this was quite a huge process to achieve this low particle flux settings, and we were very happy that we um, arrived there and that we can use it now in its stable settings, yeah. Um, 